He died for me in that sin. He died for me when I was dancing in that strip club. He died mm-hmm. for me when I was escorting, exploiting my body. He died for me in that moment and he loved me yeah. in that moment. And he was providing a way out and saying like, come, I don't want you to live like that anymore. You don't have to live like that anymore. <laughs> Okay, good morning, everybody. So today we are talking to Paige Lohman, otherwise known as Girl Redeemed. She is a wife, a mom, even a new mom. She just had another baby. So congrats. Uh, She is a a podcast host, works at a nonprofit helping human trafficking victims and volunteers in strip club ministry. Paige has been redeemed from stripping, escorting, drug addiction, and even cancer. Um, So I'm just so excited to hear about your story today, Paige. I'm so glad Uh, we had been scheduled a couple months back to have you on the show. Uh, And then you had your beautiful baby boy. So I just, I trust God's timing so much. And I'm so glad that we could have you here today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad we connected when I saw you, I think originally on TikTok. And I heard your story and I heard how you were looking for other guests on your podcast that had come out of the adult industry. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's me. And and I just love, you know, hearing other stories from other women come out and all of us just coming together and testifying that God can change anybody. I love what you're doing here. So thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes. And something that I really love about your story too, and having listened to your other interviews is a lot of times girls who do go into stripping, um, they also do end up dabbling in other things like escorting, but this is a little bit harder for most people to talk about. So I love that you're so open and honest and just vulnerable with that. And I know that that comes from a place um, that comes from the fact that you have been redeemed from this. You know, you've turned to 180 so you can talk about the past and not feel, you know, crippled in the shame of that. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about that a little more because we haven't had many people um, go deep into that. And even with my testimony, I didn't get into exactly like escorting and having an agent like you did. Um, but I definitely did get into sugar daddies and meeting guys for dates on these apps and yeah. um, from the club. And so I definitely did dabble into that. Um, but when I talk about it, even I still, it's still like a, I don't want to say touchy area, but I'm very careful in how I talk yeah. about it. And I usually just end up saying, you know, I did dark things for money that I never would have imagined I would have been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just want to shed a little bit more light onto that today if you'd be willing to go there and just talk a little bit about that world um how you got into it how it was sold to you um the kinds of men that are you know buying these Mm -hmm. girls um and just anything else that you want to share about that Okay, yeah, I would love to go into it however the Holy Spirit leads. And um, it did take me a while to be open and transparent with my story and share, you know, what God would have me share. And it's, you know, God's just been putting it on my heart because I want to raise awareness of what is happening and the realities of it. That it could be happening in your city. Like it could be happening to, you know, parents out there to your daughters, like, yeah. and, and how easy it is to sort of get groomed and recruited into that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And that could happen from anybody. Like I didn't have this, you know, horrible upbringing. I had a great upbringing and I want to just raise awareness of, the fact that this is happening and so that you, you know, look, can know what signs to look out for in your own self. And if you're a parent in your children or in a friend, even just to know that this is going on, because I think that'll help us, um, help these women get out of that life, knowing that it's a reality. Yes. That it's a very real thing that, um, people just aren't really talking about. And that's something I love about your story too, is I can relate so much. And the fact that it seemed on the outside, maybe like you're living this normal life, you're going to college, like it may have seemed like you were doing well, but deep down, like the drug addiction was happening, then the stripping and then the escorting. And so, yeah, I'm glad that you want to just help sound the alarm um, Mm -hmm. for the girls that are hurting and, and hiding it very well. So I also like that you mentioned that you had a great upbringing 
Um, would you mind just kind of going back to the beginning a little bit and telling us about your childhood and what sort of led you into the path of later beginning to abuse drugs? I know that was one of the first steps of your of your spiral into this. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, Sin City, I like to say, but um, mm-hmm. thankfully God restored me. Um, and where sin abounds, grace abounds. And so um, I didn't have <clears throat> this, um, you know, bad upbringing for the most part. Um, I, my mom worked a lot. I had two loving parents. There were no drugs and alcohol in the home. There wasn't any abuse in the home. I think the main thing, and I talked about this, and this is often a common thing that happens, I think, with people that sometimes get exploited later is a root of rejection I had because my mom worked a lot Mm -hmm. and she worked a lot because she wanted to provide for us. And at one point in time, she was the breadwinner and um, my dad was like Mr. Mom. So my dad would be the one to like take me to piano lessons or take me to swimming or you know pick me up from school and I sometimes felt like I came second place to my mom's career like we'd be out Mm -hmm. to dinner and it'd be she'd say she'd meet us there at five and then it'd be six and then it'd be seven Mm -hmm. and then she'd say you know what I'll just meet you at home and you know at the time I don't really think I could process that but I um I think I interpreted that, you know, in my mind and it developed a stronghold that, you know, I wasn't, um, that, that she loved her job more or like I wasn't enough. It it was that, it was that stronghold and that false belief system. Like I'm not enough, but I found that, you know, when I would perform, perform well in school and this created some sort of like a perfectionist mentality when I got straight A's or like when I did good and, um, in a recital or something, I would get that attention from her. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I guess I have to kind of earn love by performing well. And that, um, that, that transferred over into how I looked at God, um, later Mm -hmm. in life. But, um, Mm -hmm. when I was eight, she was diagnosed with cancer and, I had to really kind of put the pieces together because I didn't really talk about what was going on. And it was, and even at that age, um, from like eight to 13, I'm trying to make it seem like nothing is wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I would tell her mom, because my parents did get divorced. And I said, mom, are you going to get married again? Are you going to, um, let's put the house together because we got, Mm -hmm. we had moved and I'm like, why don't you furnish the basement or like do the backyard or like make it look nice here? And when I had friends over, I'm like, mommy, you need to wear your wig. Like, I don't want my mm-hmm. friends to know. And um, I was just ashamed, I guess, embarrassed. And I mean, at mm-hmm. that age, um, I I knew I could have been more loving and gracious towards my mom, of course. But at that age, I'm just like, I want to make it seem like everything's perfect on yes. the outside because I don't want to um, just be reminded of the fact that I could lose my mom at any moment. Like this is my security. And um, so that feeling of abandonment came in as well. And all these things um, I brought into, you know, later on in life that caused me to end up abusing drugs and alcohol to just numb myself from all the pain and the reality. So we did end up losing her when I was, um, about 13 no I was 14 okay. right before I went to high school and it was that summer that I just I developed this intense eating disorder I was not eating I was severely underweight um, again it was just me trying to control um, the one thing that I can control mm-hmm. and I was looking towards my peers to get attention so yeah. um, I found that when I would lose weight you know I would get I, I thought was positive attention from people at school and because my family was so focused on her and and she couldn't give me the attention that I wanted because she was sick. Yeah. Um, so that was just a really hard season. And then when we ended up losing her um, and I got into high school, I just was started hanging out with uh, my best friend at the time. And she she was working at like a juice shop with hippie type people and they were <laughs> smoking marijuana and doing whatever, <laughs> acid, LSD, whatever. And I started hanging out with them. And I think that's when I smoked weed for the first time. Okay. And, um, and then that just opened, you know, Pandora's box. Like I 
went to more parties and at more parties they had other things they had you know they had um cocaine they had ecstasy um i started hanging out with guys you know fornicating having boyfriends you know and i thought this worked out for me because after my mom passed my aunt helped raise me her sister but also my dad and my dad worked in the casino business so he'd be out working all night till like four in the morning and i would just have a field day you know like mm. and it, it looked bad on the outside because i went to this nice private school you know this yep. nice this nice well-to-do school girl. And then at night I was just hanging out with the wrong crowd, um, hanging out with people that would just um, get into trouble, you know, and do drugs. And that's what I would do until I just basically dug myself into the ground. And my dad and I both thought thought that going off to college in Reno would kind of save me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought so too. Hey everybody, first off, thank you so much for watching. Secondly, if you're enjoying this conversation, please support this show by liking, subscribing, leaving a review, or sharing it with a friend. And now back to the episode. Something that you said that was really interesting to me is how um, the devil really groomed you into what would later become your heroin addiction yeah. um, with these step by step, you know one door opens the next door. And I can also see how he groomed you into this double life altogether because you had been sort of living a bit of a double life since you were a young child. Um, And that's something I can relate to in my story is I think back to um, that split that I had where I was was some kind of way out in public, but then another way at home, um, you know, suffering in silence and all of these things. And then later on, I found like when you're working in the entertainment industry and you're doing these soul selling things, you're just continuing what you were already basically programmed to do as a child of living this double life that everything is fine. Meanwhile, these really, you know, these things that are not fine are happening um, behind the scenes. So I can see how this would eventually turn into something else, especially as you, so now you're moving away from home, you're going to college. So what were sort of the next steps after that? Um, I went up to college and I just thought my life was going to change forever. But um, wherever you are, there you are, basically. And Mm -hmm. um, I forgot to mention, like, I did, um, my mom did take me to church here and there growing up, but I didn't have, so I learned, I got the foundation of the gospel. And even in, in high school, I went to a Lutheran high school. So we had chapel and they taught us about Jesus but I had no relationship with him. So I just wanted to mention that. And when I was in college, I just thought that my life would change magically, I guess. But I took my drug addiction with me. Um, Mm -hmm. I just kind of suppressed it for a while. Uh, I ended up joining a sorority to kind of make friends and at that college, a total college experience. Um, But they would go to frat parties and I would go to all the frat parties and I wanted to be a part of the culture and the culture was drinking, right? Drink, drinking and partying on the weekend. But the difference between them and me is like they could drink and then Monday morning they'd be back in their 8 a.m. class and be functioning and I'd be um, just hungering for like pills or like Mm -hmm. more or I would sink into a depression where I didn't even want to leave my dorm room and would be sleeping all day. And um, that's that's what happened to me. And then finally, you know, I'd be looking around to see who had drugs on campus and I I found those people. But Um, I didn't find heroin up there at the time. So every time I'd go back to Vegas, I would hit up those old using buddies and I'd be doing heroin. And I kept telling myself, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Or I'm going to just do this for a couple months. And then I'm going to stop right before, like a week before I have to go back up to Reno. But every time it'd be like using up until that day and then just having a full-blown panic attack meltdown because I had to go back to school and turning into like a monster and screaming, you know, like screaming at my dad. Like, And when I went back up for my next semester, I'd be in full heroin withdrawal trying to focus on my classes and again, like living that double life and nobody really asked questions. No professor ever came up to me. It was such a big, the classes were so big. No one really mm-hmm. could tell what was going on. Yeah. 
And, you know, when I would find pills up there, I would just hide in the bathroom and smoke them or whatever. So Um, how did you get into doing heroin? Just kind of going back to that process, because that's a big jump. A lot of people, even um, I remember in college being exposed to all the kind of drugs, you know, cocaine, weed, acid, molly, all of these things. But like meth and heroin, I don't know. That was the one, like the one boundaries I the one kind of boundary that I thought I had is, oh, I'll never do that. And maybe that's because that was my parents' preferred drugs. And I was like, okay, they did the hard wow. drugs. I'm not going to be like them. Um, but how, how did you end up doing heroin? Like what was the, what was the trajectory into that? Yeah. What's crazy is I had that boundary too. And when my, so we started off uh, with um, like Oxycontin, their little pills, mm-hmm. painkillers. It's like basically Oxycontin is like synthetic heroin, you could say. Um, mm. And because it's a, it's a strong painkiller and so is heroin. It's just yeah. a very much stronger painkiller. Um, and I was, I was, so I became addicted to those pills and it was an easy transit. And I love, I mean, I don't love the devil loves how he makes this so easy is that the kids are, you know, smoking these pills. They're putting them on foil and they're lighting them up mm-hmm. and they're smoking a pill. So mm-hmm. I was doing that. And these pills were like $15 a pill. And then they were like $25 a pill. Um, and I had to do at least three because your tolerance keeps building and building, right? So yeah. one day we were just buying so many from my friends. Um, friend who's a dealer and she said oh they have this they have uh he gave he gave me the pills but he also has this stuff called black you know and I was like ew what is that <laughs> is that <laughs> I'm not doing that what do I look like I'm not a drug addict <laughs> meanwhile I'm highly <laughs> addicted to pills thinking like yeah. oh this is a little more glamorous than heroin right yeah. um but she's like just try it and I'm like okay I'll try it ended up throwing wow. up that whole night but I did try it, and the high was like a hundred times high better. It was cheaper. It was easy to get. So you know, it, you smoke it the same way. I never injected yeah. by the grace of God, Hallelujah, because I think I would have yeah. died. Um, but wow. yeah, so you're already smoking. You're already addicted. You're running out of money. You need a bigger high. It was yep. just like heroin's like here I am. You know, yeah. Try me. I think. Honestly, I think it was the same thing with my parents that led them into mm-hmm. meth and heroin because there was a really crooked doctor in our small wow. country town who was writing scripts for pain pills. He ended up losing his practice because okay. of it, but he was like the only doctor in our town. So everybody went to this guy um, and he was writing all these pain pill scripts. And that's why there's so many drug addicts yes. in our town specifically. Um, and so I, I could see how that trajectory of it starts with pain pills And then they're becoming more expensive and you find, okay, the the high is getting harder to have. And so why you would then resort to something that maybe, would you compare the high? Like, is it similar, but just cheaper and... It's similar, um, but more intense. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Yeah. And it's scary now because now they're lacing those pills that you get on the street with fentanyl and fentanyl is killing people. Like... Yeah. And and the people that are doing heroin, they even need a bigger high than heroin, and they're doing fentanyl. So I'm grateful yeah. that I got delivered before fentanyl was like a big thing. Then, yeah, my mom had literal people die around her. She's seen so many people die. That's have sad. have you? Did you ever see anything like that? Because you're still in the college environment, like you're still around college people when you're doing this, right? So it's a little. I don't know. It's yeah. not like you're just in the druggy scene. Yeah, I wasn't. I was just like a little bit in and then I would go back to my college life. Yeah. A little bit in. Like, I'm just going to come visit you guys. Okay, I'm about going back to college. going to be that <laughs> college girl now. Um, so thankfully, I I didn't see it in front of my face. But yeah. I, I have so many just old using buddy friends that have passed away. Um, and I yeah. see it all the time. You know, I look on my Facebook. It seems like every other week or something, it's like, Oh, this person passed away, and I it just breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, it breaks my heart. Or like people that you know were in twelve step community with me um, mm-hmm. when I was did have periods of sobriety because I did, and twelve step helped me a lot. Um, God, yeah, take us me. through that. Yeah. Like, so, when did you start doing twelve step? When did you begin to realize you had a problem? Um, well, when I so I was in college, and an ex boyfriend had gone to twelve step initially, and so did that best friend that actually introduced me to heroin. 
um, she started going to Narcotics Anonymous meetings. Um, and so I just was like, I, I think one day I was in the bathroom. I called my dad. Like I was smoking heroin. I was smoking pills up there in college in the bathroom. I broke down. I called my dad. I told him everything. And I'm just like, I remembered those AA meetings. And I think, first of all, I tried to tell a guidance counselor on, on campus, I need a community of of peers, like I need help. And she told me there was this community on campus of students who were in recovery from drugs and alcohol. And they had like a lounge, they had like a place where they could have meetings on campus. But when I went there, um, I was like one of two maybe students. And I'm thinking, oh no, am I the only one in college that wants to try to get sober? How am I going to do this? Um, And so that led me to just walk, find a go online to alcoxanonymous.com or something. And I went and I found my first meeting and I just walked there on my own. And um, I ended up meeting a girl and she um, brought me to like my first kind of young people's meeting. And I met other people around my age, you know, early 20s that were trying to get sober. And that helped me immensely. And then I got really involved with that community on campus. And I started planning events with them. I started meeting new friends that were sober and that helped me so much. And I actually did really well for a while in college because of that community. Mm, okay. Yeah, I've heard someone say it was one of the previous uh, podcasts with uh, I had Gerald and Tabby's guy by and he was recovering from a pornography addiction. And he was saying, yeah, that's why I have a newsletter and I'm writing books and I'm work. I'm mentoring. He goes, this is a part of my sobriety. Like when you're helping and giving back these things help yeah. you to stay sober and accountable as well um, from those addictions. So I could see how that would be helpful. Um, and that's even a part of those 12 step programs, right? Is the giving back portion. Yeah. Service. Yeah. Being of service. Mm-hmm. Um, so that helped me a lot. And, and step three is, you know, turning your, your will in your life over to a higher power. Now they don't believe in, you know, the God of the Bible, all of them, they all kind of believe in a God of their understanding. And that was a difference. But at the time, you know, me having no relationship with God, And then me having the foundation of Christ, you know, it was the beginning of me starting to surrender part of my heart to God. And so I'm really Mm. grateful for that. So was this you getting involved with the 12 step recovery program? Was this before or after your first time in the strip club? This was before. Yeah, I had a bit of a relapse. So tell us, how did you find yourself in the club then after you're, you're in college, you're trying to do the right thing, you're going through recovery now. So what led you into the club? So the devil was always just right there waiting for a vulnerable weak moment. And he did. And I'm in the library one night. It's like maybe 10 p.m. I think working on a report. <laughs> and this girl sits down next to me and she's high on opiates. I can tell everybody's looking at her because she's nodding off. You kind of like nod off um, when you're high. And I know. And I was like, I'm thinking, what is going on right now? I'm over here like trying to do better. (laughs) And like the temptation right there, right next to me. Because I Mm. know if she's high, she has connections, obviously. I'm like thinking, what is going on? This was so weird. Am I in the twilight zone? Um, (laughs) I follow her into the bathroom because a part of me is like, I need to help get her home. Like she doesn't, she's incoherent. She needs help. And I managed to help her like get to a computer because her phone was dead, type in like her Facebook password and get get on the phone and get someone to pick her up. And I got her number two and I'm thinking, okay, maybe I could start taking her to meetings with me. Maybe I can help her. Mm. But then like, you know, my flesh and the devil's like, oh, well, maybe you can kind of get to know her and do other things. Angel and devil, you got two voices going on. Which one are you going to listen to? Yeah. So that was exactly what happened. And then I, I, I friended her on Facebook and I thought it was really interesting. I looked at her job description and it said that she worked like as a dancer at a local strip club. She was super open because she also worked. She also like wrote for the sex, like a sex column at our newspaper. And it was just, she was very out there, like with her sexuality and very open about that. And I was just very curious, you know, why is she so out there? And she dances at a strip club and um and i think i'd always wondered you know what is it like in a strip club you know how much money can you actually yeah. make and so yeah, you we, said something on another interview about that you're like i think every girl kind of has that question yeah um 
it's just whether or not like some of us are a little more fearless and curiosity really can kill the cat sometimes. So this curiosity kept, you know, gnawing at you. Uh, and then w- what happened next? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> You know, sometimes I hear that like around me, I would hear that in class, like, I'm just going to be a stripper and make all this money, forget college. And it's Mm -hmm. like, okay, but I really did that and it wasn't as glamorous as you think. But anyways, um, I just, I I told her, can I just come with you one night and see how it is? And she's like, yeah, come on. And okay. I went with her one night and it was like this little hole in the wall, dingy, really dark strip club, smoky. It was a bar slash strip club. Mm -hmm. Um, it just was not glamorous, <laughs> yeah. but I went in and the girls are like, oh, who are you? You know, and like, I'm like wanting them to accept me. And I think I give them like a fake name because I was told to do that. I was like, don't give them your real name. And mm-hmm. I don't know. They just asked if I wanted to try out and I just said yes. And I don't know why I said yes. I was just like, yes. So I'm like, I don't have any shoes. I borrow my friend's shoes and it just wore whatever I was wearing underneath. And I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew you, you get on. I would watch other girls. You just get on stage and, you know, dance. And yeah. they would just take off their clothes. And that's all you have to really do. So I did yeah. that. And I remember being on stage and just the light was blinding me. And there was only like maybe a few customers. But I I was so ashamed. I, I think I didn't have. Well, I probably had drugs in my system. But I wasn't high that very moment. And so yeah. it was. um I couldn't even look them in the eye. I had to just look over their heads um, because I was just ashamed and thinking, what am I doing? I had to, I had to disassociate so much. I had to, I like told myself, I'm just this like, I had this like alter ego. I'm just this other Mm -hmm. person. Um, And it was like, I was acting in a movie and I was like in a fantasy land, like out of my real life and into this fake life. And I just, put on like a front and then pretended like I was having a good time. But inside I'm like, my soul is like, what are you doing? Like, this isn't you. This doesn't feel right. But after that night, I got my first taste of cash, a lot of cash in my hand. I don't know if it was just $300 or something, but I had never had that much in my hand at one time. And me, you know, her having drugs and she got me connected to a dealer who sold heroin you know, I think she had her drop off the drugs that night or something similar. So I have all this money in my hand, heroin's right there. I could spend it and then I could make more the next day. Like it just was like hand in glove. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm really reflecting too, like how quick the devil moves. Like the moment he feels an in, he's going to just like pull you in as quick as possible. And I think about, you know, the peace of God's spirit and when God is telling you something and how you really have to be still. He says, be still and know that I am God. And when you pause and you listen for God's voice, um, he doesn't rush us, but it feels like with the devil and then with the fast life, everything is like boom, boom, boom right now. Um, you don't even really have time to tune in to what God is saying to you. Um, It's just one thing after the next, and now you're full-on spiraling. Yeah, all of a sudden, I'm like working at a strip club, addicted to heroin again, and it's every weekend and every day, and I'm like, how did I get here? I was doing so well. I was sober. I was, you know, finishing up a report in college. I, you know, I, I didn't have any ties to this life, and now just this whole different dark world opened up to me, and those boundaries that I had for myself as a woman, I don't know where they went. It was like the line that I drew in the sand just became invisible. And um, it was like you said, like you give the devil an inch and he's like, I'm coming in. Yep. Yeah. One little yes. And then next thing you know, you're saying bigger and bigger yeses. So did you stay in college now at this point or what, what happened with that? Yeah, so all this was happening towards the last semester of my senior year. And Mm -hmm. so I was, so those last few weeks, I was just getting by by the skin of my teeth. I'm like, I am going to white knuckle this thing and then I'm going to do whatever I want. So I graduated. So I graduated and I got my bachelor's degree in criminal justice pre law. And, um, so that was good, but then yes. I would tell myself, okay, well, I have my degree, so no one can tell me what to do. 
Mm. You know, I'm an adult, I'm independent, I'm making money. You know, I kind of just developed this pride, this superiority. And, yeah. um, you know, if, if anyone had anything negative to say about me dancing, I would just be like, I'm, I'm doing good. It looks like I'm doing good on paper. And I actually had a really good internship at the time. I would have internships at law firms, you know, internships mm-hmm. for like, um, the, the county and things like that. And, um, by day, I was wow. that nice, successful intern college graduate and at night I was a heroin addict um, working at a strip club. What's up, you guys? I'm so excited to announce a new Raised and Redeemed merch drop. We took our apparel to the next level this time with our new Running to the Cross design that you can order in a crew neck, hoodie, oversized tee, or even on your new favorite coffee mug. Check out this design and more on RaisedAndRedeemed.com to order yours and support the show today. When then did escorting get presented to you? Was that somebody while you were in the club gave the idea or, and, and what were the next steps that even led you to that? If you were, you know, seemingly making good money and doing well where you were at? Yeah, I think it started, um, no one really like propositioned me, like solicited me in the club, but I knew that girls were doing more to make more money in the VIP rooms, but I was kind of scared to do that because I didn't want to encounter law enforcement knowing that mm-hmm. I wanted to maybe be a lawyer one day. And I didn't want, I was always like a fearful of going to jail or, you know, um, committing a crime. But yeah. um, I started looking online actually, and I don't even know what put that idea in my head. I think I was just looking for more jobs and maybe even starting with promotional modeling jobs where you can go and kind of be like a party girl and set mm-hmm. the atmosphere and just go party with with groups of people and men and so I started looking up those jobs on Craigslist and that opened up a world for me when I saw like the gig section and the event section on um, the talent section mm-hmm. and I remember seeing an ad and it said something like hot girls want to make a thousand dollars a night we want college girls 18 to 25 <laughs> you know and I'm like oh my gosh I'm 23 Um, what do you have to do to make that kind of money? I'm already here exploiting myself. Like what else, you know, can I do? Um, and I would, I remember calling one of those ads and, um, it was an escort agency and it called themselves like a companion agency and they Mm. have it under the guise, like, you're just gonna be, um, you're gonna be like a, a girlfriend for a professional man for the night. And, you know, whatever he wants, if he wants to take you out or something, you're just going to get hired to be his companion. And I'm thinking, well, that sounds easy enough. And Mm -hmm. so I call the agent and he says, meet me at a local bar by the college. So I meet him. He meets me in the back because he's like, we need to talk privately. And I'm thinking, you know, why, why is this so secretive, you know? But then when he talks to me, I'm thinking, oh, okay, you're not just a companion, like you do more with these men, yeah. but you're very hush hush about it. But okay. it's kind of just, you just kind of know um, yeah. that's how you're going to make the most money is if you go on a date and you, you know, ex- ex- use your, exploit your body, right? Yeah. Um, that's how it's interesting that you, that you say that because it was kind of the same with the Seeking Arrangements app yeah. that I found in college. Um, where it's sold as just a dating app, you know, but like everybody who gets it knows what it is. You just, you just kind of know, like you said. Um, and so, you know, these guys might ask you on a date or something like this, but you know, the direction of that is eventually giving your body to them. Um, and that's where you're really going to make money. I remember I had girlfriends that like started doing it before I did because I was afraid. And so I was watching how it went for them. And they would meet at like Chick-fil-A or something for the first meet. Um, and then the guy would give them $100. And then he'd say, okay, now we're going to have another kind of date. So then they would meet him again. And it would be like expecting more each yeah. time and yeah, paying yeah. more each time. Yeah. So is it kind of the same with this except for now you called it – now you have a white collar pimp. Yeah, that's what I would call my agent is he's not this like gorilla pimp, gangster pimp that you see on the streets. Yeah. He's this like guy that looks, you know, put together, you know, has that a nice career on the outside, 
But meanwhile, he's making money off of exploiting you. And so we made an arrangement where, you know, he would tell me you make 300 for the hour out here. It's more, it's like 500 an hour. Um, but he would take like a hundred and I would only keep 200 or something. And all he has to do is basically he's the one that connects me to the client. And so the client would call in to the agency and he would have like pictures of the girls on online and the client would say, Oh, I want that one. Or sometimes it was bait and switch or it'd just be a girl. And then they would just, um, the agent would connect him with any one of us and, um, even if it's not that one, the client's already okay. there. So usually they don't turn you down. But yeah. um, And then he would have the client call me. I'd have a Google number set up. And so it wasn't my real number. And I would answer the phone and use a fake name and be like, just, oh, I'm so excited to meet you. And then mm-hmm. he would tell me his address. And I would actually drive there to the place. So I felt like at first I thought this agent was going to protect me, but when I realized I'm the one driving to a stranger's home where I don't even, I don't even know these men. All I know is that maybe this agency had worked with them before and that's all I know really. And so I'm meeting these guys. Um, one I met at his home, another one I met at like a hotel, another one I met at a home and it places like Tahoe cause it was up in Reno. So Tahoe, Reno, and sometimes they were really nice places, really nice hotels. But again, I don't know the guy at all. And yeah. I would meet them and, um, you know, we, I would just be with them for the hour and usually would end up with, you know, giving my body away. They want to make the most of the hour. Yeah. And that's what I would tell myself. I'm like, all you have to do is get through this hour. Because mm-hmm. it, it would start to really weigh on me and weigh on my spirit. Yeah. Most of the time when I was doing this in Reno, I was high. I'd be like yeah. getting high on the way there because I just, I had to disassociate from what I was doing. It was too hard for me and um, trauma invoking, but I don't know. It was just like, I don't know. It, it just, I was kind of mad at myself because why am I allowing myself to be in these situations? But yeah. at the same time, I was so addicted to the money. I was addicted yep. to the chaos and I was, addicted to the drugs and so it was mm-hmm. very easy for me to get sucked in yeah yeah no I appreciate you sharing that and something I haven't you know I haven't talked to anybody about on the show yet because it just hasn't come up like I can relate to you in these things um, is I remember you know there were numerous guys that I went on these dates with um, and some of them I remember one of them was like a younger nerdier kind of guy who just he really struggled getting girls and he was very sweet um but he wanted more of like a girlfriend he wanted somebody who would come around his family and um, someone to take to the mall to buy uggs in person he didn't just want to give me quick money like use me and buy and for some reason like for me at that time I wanted to get this over with as quick as possible I don't want to carry on a fake relationship and like you know, this be draining me throughout my week. I don't want to meet anybody's family. So that's, I think, why I was doing the deeper, darker things for the quicker cash of like, let's just get this done in an hour. I never want to see you again. (laughs) And, And it was over. But the thing was, is it was never really over. Like those things were staining my soul deeply. And I was doing the same thing of abusing drugs and alcohol just to, just to cope with it. Yeah, like you create, we think it's just a one and done thing. We're just going to have this brief transaction, but you're making soul ties with these men and Mm -hmm. like you're giving away something that was meant only for your husband in marriage. And God did that to protect us because he knows that, you know, it hurts when you give that part of yourself to someone who's not meant to be your husband forever. Yeah, yeah. And, and even the demonic activity that happens during those interactions, I oh had no idea. Gosh. And I can't even tell you after I got involved in this, I feel like I had like all these demons in my life. I would get thoughts out of nowhere that I'd never even thought of before became suicidal, like mm-hmm. more addicted to drugs, spirit of perversion. Like I would get all these thoughts, these, these gross thoughts that I had never had before. And I believe yeah. it was because I was interacting with clients that had a bunch of demons, right? Oh, yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. When you, when you're sleeping with somebody, you're literally combining your spirits a hundred percent. Was there like one, did you ever have like one, like ultimate, like this was the most horrifying experience or was it just kind of all, it was just kind of all that? I think it was just kind of all, I mean, there were some, well, I don't know. It's hard for me to even think about and process, but there was some that were just so deep in like perversion and addiction and they were like degrading, like very degrading. Like they'd be watching, you know, pornography while Mm -hmm. we're like together on a date and it was just like horrible, like to, to watch like the the kind that they were watching and then, you know, to have me there and just to see them like so just lost. And I just, I think it was moments like that after that I just felt so disgusted and I felt yeah. like a piece of trash and I would start yes. to think like I'm more valuable than this or even when uh cuz I did this again in in California but my agent at the time was a little more controlling and he would have me just go over the whole session with him in the car after like debrief and if i mm-hmm. did if i said anything wrong or something happened wrong he would just flat out yell at me and like you know he was very just kind of narcissistic wow and um he'd be like you can't wear that you know why are your legs all cut up like like from shaving or something and he would just <laughs> like uh he'd be like you that's your property like you can't be wearing that you can't be doing this why did you do this with the client you didn't tell me and then meanwhile he'd be exploiting me and using me as well and so it was moments like that after those interactions I would just think I kind of come to the a breaking point like why am I allowing people to treat me like this why Mm -hmm. am I why am I doing this you know it was kind of just be like Maybe it was the Holy Spirit too, just reminding me I'm more valuable than this. Yes. Oh, so he would he would try to do things with you as well sexually. This, this yeah, statement. and then he would give me like a a like I would go with a client and then I would, um, he would pick, cause this was, uh, an agent that actually picked me up. He would drop me off and then pick me up, um, when he picked me up. So I'd make the money with the client, give him his cut. And then he'd be like, if you want to do extra with me, I'll throw you a hundred. So, wow. yeah. Oh so being gosh. exploited again, even by him. Ugh. Like, I know this feeling too of like when I was doing these things at the same time, I was going to frat parties and I was wanting to have a boyfriend and be loved by someone truly. And, you know, I don't know if you can relate to that and just feeling like, ugh, like nobody's ever going to love me. Like, I am so disgusting and just having these kinds of thoughts. But then I had no idea. Like, now I'm just a completely new person now that I've been redeemed by the Lord. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm sure you can relate to that. Like, yeah. you no longer carry that shame once you've welcomed the Holy Spirit into your life and you truly do yeah. repent from this and turn from this. You just like, no, you you have this peace. But before I accepted Jesus, I just felt like eternally dirty. Like I just yeah. messed up my whole life and nobody would ever be able to love me. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell like, what was the turning point for you? Like, when did you accept the Lord slash how did he begin to call you out of this lifestyle? Yeah, sure. Well, he started calling me out with um, a Mr. Club ministry, and um, that's what I'm currently doing now. But I believe it was Scarlet Hope. They have a strip club ministry out in Reno. And the ladies came into the strip club one night, and they had cookies and baked goods with them. And they were smiling and happy, a little bit older than us. And I'm thinking, who are these ladies? And they end up <laughs> sitting down and talking to some of the girls there. And I was kind of embarrassed to talk to them because I was – you know, smoking heroin in the back. And I just, um, I wasn't ready and I didn't know who they were, but I would be eavesdropping around the corner. And I just remember them mentioning Jesus and praying with the women. And they had a little prayer box and they said, if, you know, you don't want to talk to us or approach us, it's fine. But if you have a prayer request, if we can be praying with you throughout the week, we write it down. And so I remember writing down on one of those cards saying something like, God help me. And he knew, he knew everything that I was going through, everything that I was doing. And that deep down, I wanted to stop. I wanted to stop eventually. I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I mean, I had, 
I have plans to go to law school and Mm -hmm. have a future and get married one day, right? Um, What am I doing? Uh, I was thinking this is just a temporary season, but then I would always say, okay, I'm going to stop tomorrow. I'm going to stop tomorrow. And tomorrow seemed to never come. So I'm thinking, God, I need some divine intervention here. And so I prayed and I wrote something down on that card and I believe that they were praying for me, um, but it wasn't until years later that I actually surrendered my heart to God. It was in California. I had moved. I ended up going to rehab. Um, my dad called me and said, "This is the uh, this is the final straw. You either go to rehab or we're done. I have to cut you off. Mm-hmm. I cannot watch my daughter kill herself. I already saw your mom die. I can't watch my daughter die. You're basically throwing all that tuition money down the toilet and killing yourself." And that really, like, that really hit me. And I just said yes. And I ended up going to rehab for 30 days, got sobered up, cleaned up. While I was in rehab, although it was a secular rehab, they invited the girls if you wanted to go to church on Sunday. So I remember just going with some girls to church with um, the the supervisor. And I started having encounters with God while I was there. He began speaking Mm -hmm. to me. And I had my Bible with me, and some some days I would just get a couple of the girls who wanted to at the rehab, and we would sit together and we would read the Bible together. Mm-hmm. And it was just God was beginning to, I was beginning to build that relationship with Him. Wow. I moved out to California, moved into a sober living for 10 months, and I ended up doing really well in my sobriety. And I enrolled and I got accepted to law school while I was out here in California. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah. God just began to pick up the pieces of your life. Yeah. Yeah, But my relationship with God was still developing. Um, I, I had actually, I was going to 12 step meetings and a woman there after a speaker meeting, she was standing outside a friend. Well, kind of a friend of mine, she started inviting me to her women's groups and they were connected to a church out in Whittier, California. And I started going to her women's groups. And then that's when, um, through going to those women's groups, I started getting planted in that church. And that's Mm. when I went up to the altar and, um, I just surrendered my heart to Jesus. Um, but, um, backtracking a little bit, I did have a slip up in the escorting agency here in California with that, with that pimp, that agent that was super controlling. (laughs) You can call him a pimp. It's basically that. (laughs) Yeah. So I was doing that for a few more months out, out here, stripped at a, dance uh, strip club maybe one night and then I was but this time I was doing it sober Mm. so everything was hitting me like a thousand times harder and I remember one night in my room I'm crying out to God I'm like God I can't do this anymore please help me help me I I feel so ashamed and I was starting to get really convicted I was starting to develop a fear of God I was starting to think about what if I die this way and thinking about heaven and thinking about hell? And I remember praying these foxhole prayers at night. Like, God, I would I would repent every night, even though the next night going and doing the same thing, which isn't like true repentance. But I was starting to confess, starting to admit what I was doing was wrong. I started to call other Christians that I knew and just said, hey, I have to tell you something. I'm escorting again. I'm, you know, living this double life. And that is when this weight was just like lifted. I was finally becoming transparent. It was less of like mm. his secret life. It was more of me finally opening up. And wow. that's when God started to move. I felt his love. The gospel started to make sense to me that when I he died, we were yet sinners. He died for me in that sin. He died for me when I was dancing in that strip club. He died Mm -hmm. for me when I was escorting, exploiting my body. He died for me in that moment. And he loved me in that moment. And he was providing a way out and saying like, come, I don't want you to live like that anymore. You don't have to live like that anymore. (laughs) Um, And I, when I repented, I felt, wow, like before I felt kind of condemned. I felt like you were saying like dirty but I felt washed clean. I felt forgiven. Wow, Paige. Yeah. I have tears in my eyes. And oh my gosh, I'm just thinking too how like your sobriety was really the first step to this because then you were no longer numbing out the voice of God. Now you could hear the voice of God and you you felt his spirit and you felt that he was grieving over this and, and you could no longer do these things. Um yeah as freely as you once did them. So sobriety being the first part. And then also I loved how you explained the process of repentance. 
Um, do you remember how exactly you explained that? Or would you be able to explain that for the listeners now, that process? Yeah. Well, first I felt like that godly sorrow. I felt like something is wrong here. And I felt like this is not what God called me to be. And also developing a fear of the Lord, like uh, displeasing him, you know, starting to think about hell and the fact that hell is real and (laughs) if I don't change my ways like or if I don't get washed clean by a savior like that's that's the the road to sin is death and destruction and so first having that godly sorrow admitting what I'm doing is wrong then confessing it confessing it to the Lord um, confessing it to others that helped me a lot And then finally, the final step is actually getting his strength to turn away. And that's when I just drove to a parking lot one night. I called that agent and I said, I can't. I was like shaking. My heart was beating Mm -hmm. fast. I thought maybe he was going to come after me, you know, all these lies. (laughs) But that could happen sometimes. But thankfully, it didn't happen to me. Um, And I called him. I said, I can't work for you anymore. I'm done with this life. And he's thinking, oh, no, um, what if you just work? Um, what if I just cut your hours or you just, you know, do stuff with me and not with clients? And I said, no, I'm done. I had to block his number because he was harassing me. But when I blocked that number, it was like just this spiritual door opened up to my new life. And so God then. just started to direct my path to the next step. And and I can, <laughs> it wasn't easy. It was not an easy transition. It wasn't like all of a sudden, like everything gets better. No, I had to walk through my wilderness season. Like when Moses brought the people out of their slavery, I was in slavery, I was in bondage. But before getting to the promised land, you have to walk through that desert where God is pruning you. God is making you a new creation. God is stripping off those old lies. He's tearing down those strongholds in your mind, getting renewed in the word building character, learning what it means to walk with the Lord. And thankfully, I met a woman at an AA meeting who introduced herself as, hi, I'm so-and-so, and and I'm a child of God, which was (laughs) not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to say, I'm an alcoholic. And I'm thinking, who is this lady? (laughs) And so I walk up to her, and I'm hungry for the word. I'm hungry for God. We build a relationship. She starts inviting me to her house, making me a cup of coffee, and we sit and read the Bible. And that's when my discipleship started. I'm so grateful for her. Yeah, she helped me so much. I love that so much. And I'm so glad you mentioned, too, the wilderness season because it isn't going to be just all sunshine and rainbows right away or ever. But, you know, you think that because finally it's like you found your father and you're coming home and you're feeling this freedom and he's giving you tastes and glimpses of this good fruit. But then there's also going to be a tough, tough season of learning new habits, um, learning to walk his ways rather than your, your past ways. Um, giving up old relationships, environments, ways of making money. It's a hard season. But I think like amidst that season, when you're walking with the Lord, he does continue to give you his strength, like you mentioned, and also a vision for your life that is now good. And it shows you why you're going through this and why you're doing this. And you can kind of see, he gives you that like hope of the future with him and why you have to go through this season, especially if you're reading your word and you know um, about the Exodus story and the people being led out of slavery and the fact that this is just a part of the process. And I am being guided to the promised land and I just have to stay faithful and obedient. Um, And I'm going to get there. Amen. Yeah, he yeah. said what he started in us, he will bring to completion. And um, that's what I remember. Like he's he started this process in me. And some things were immediate. Some things right at the altar. We, they were talking about purity. And they came up. We, they, I was shaking that day because I knew like, because there were deliverances and stuff that took place at the altar at this church all the time. And I'd see it and I'd be like scared. Like, is that going to happen to me? But I walk up to that altar and it was kind of just me and God. They said, put, you know, put your hand on. I just put my hand on my head because they were saying, put where you need healing. And Mm -hmm. I remember just feeling his love. I ended up just like hysterically bawling right there at the altar. Um, They said, you know, ask, I was asking for his forgiveness for all the, you know, sexual immorality and severing every soul tie that I had made with every person that wasn't meant to be my husband. And I did that all at the altar and I just felt like him wash me clean and deliver me. And then after that, I had no desire to ever go back. I uh, wow. lost the desire for drugs and alcohol. Um, 
Praise it just God. went away like like that. Other things took more time, like him healing my mind from depression, you know, giving me that joy back. Things like that took a little longer, but some things were just instant. And it was like, mm-hmm. I, I love you, God. I want to just follow you all the days of my mm-hmm. life. Amen. And your promised land has included um, this godly marriage with a man who loves you like Jesus. You Mm -hmm. have two beautiful children. Um, And then, you know, how I introed you, it's like now you're working in strip club ministry, uh, working for a nonprofit to help with human trafficking. Yeah. Um, Just all these amazing things. So I know we're starting to come to time here would you mind just telling the listeners how they can find you how they can stay in contact um and just some of the resources that you offer yeah i'm on social media girl redeem ministries it's at girl period redeemed um, i have a youtube channel too but still working on developing more content on there and mm-hmm. then you can find me on facebook with my name Paige loman um Right now, we launched a strip club outreach ministry the beginning of this year where we go into strip clubs in Los Angeles and Orange County and help share the love and truth of Jesus Christ. And we come in with little gifts, and Mm -hmm. sometimes we get right there into the dressing room. We're building relationships with the management where they let us go right in, which is totally a move of God at first. Some clubs don't let us in at all, but we keep praying and praying until God makes a way. And we've been having so many positive interactions with these girls you know mm-hmm. some some are not ready to receive but some are and some are so hungry and they were like like me in that club and we're praying with girls we're seeing girls come to the lord right there in the strip club praying for their <laughs> healings getting phone numbers so we could disciple them further some are like interested in bible studies and just tearing up under the anointing right there mm-hmm. in the club i just think that's so beautiful god just supernaturally opened doors for all this to happen um I have a YouTube channel and the podcast as well. And so discipling women online and then um, God opened the door for me to work at a nonprofit helping human trafficking victims. So, and I have my husband who loves me so much. We got married December of last year, had a baby right away. (laughs) Yes. So I love that you talk so much about, um, what is happening in these strip clubs and the fact that these girls are hungry they're hungry for hearing the word of god and a hope and a promise for their life um i told you we would be doing a prayer at the end i'm curious would you mind saying a prayer like how you would pray it with those girls like if if you were praying with one of those girls in the club um could you could you do a prayer um say somebody's listening and maybe they're going through that same thing yeah okay We'll pray right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for the viewers and I thank you for all the women in in the clubs, God. And I just pray, Lord, that you would show them what it means to walk with you, Lord. You would show them how much you love them, God. You love them so much that you died for them on the cross for all their mistakes, God, all their past, God, so that they could be new and redeemed, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would just shower them with your love. Let them know that they are valuable. Let them know that they were bought with a price, God, in Jesus' name. And if, you know, they are ready to surrender their life to you, God, then they can repeat this prayer with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus, I confess that you are Lord, that you are Mm -hmm. Savior, that you died on the cross for my sins. And all my mistakes, I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, cleanse me, wash me, make me whole, baptize me in the Holy Spirit, and guide me on this journey with you, God. Let me know what it means to be your Mm -hmm. child, God, and for you to be my father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.